Hello and welcome. Thank you for participating in Moorhead at Home Skywatching, hosted by Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. My name is Amy Sale. I'm an educator at Moorhead. We are a unit of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, located on campus. We also work throughout the state through a number of outreach initiatives like our mobile lab bands, our summer camp programs, and the annual North Carolina Science Festival. Our mission is to help people better understand science, technology, and health, and we do this through engaging learning opportunities like this live virtual event. We're glad to have you here with us. We're going to experience the life and death of a star in just half an hour, and Nick will get us started. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Amy. Um, welcome to Moorhead at Home Skywatching. As Amy mentioned, we are going to try to teach you all about the life and death of stars, and uh, it's a big, long process, and it can be complicated at points, but we're hoping to give you some examples of where we can see different types of stars uh, or um, remnants of stars uh, in different stages in their lifetime in our sky and kind of connect some of the pieces of the puzzle together for you. So my name's Nick. Um, we're excited you're here with us today. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we begin. Um, if you have questions during this session, we want to hear them. Uh, but the best way to get your questions to us is to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can type in your questions there, and we're going to try to reserve some time uh, towards the end of the program to, to discuss those. Um, also, the software that we're going to be using to simulate the nighttime sky is called Stellarium. You can find that at stellarium.org, and I think we'll just put that in the chat for you. Um, and uh, we highly recommend, you know, playing around with the software yourselves. We use it a lot in these sessions if you've been with us before and it's free to download and uh, you can really explore your sky um, from the comfort of your own home. So with all that being said, um, we are gonna dive into our topic for today, um, how stars live and die. But first, uh, before we dig in too much, we have a, a poll question for y'all to answer. Um, the question is, how are the following related? And we're going to be giving you some new terms today, um, so it's okay if you're not sure um, what these things are. We'll try to describe them for you. But how are the following related? A red giant, planetary nebula, and a white dwarf. And you have a few options there uh, for, for what you think. Maybe there are different stages in the life of a single star. Maybe there are different types of stars. And white dwarf, what does that have to do with space? Maybe that seems like kind of a interesting name that you never heard before. Um, so give us your best guess here uh, as to how these three objects are related. Okay, maybe a few more seconds. Make your best guess. Don't worry about being wrong. Nobody can see your, your individual answer. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Nick, it looks like most people said they are different stages in the life of a single star. Um, although some people thought, well, maybe they're just different types of stars altogether. Um, and, and many people do think that, um, but in fact, those are different stages in the life of a single star. So I'll give you an analogy. Um, you, you might think of different types of insects like a butterfly or a bee or a housefly. But you can also think about stages in the life of a single insect. So let's take a butterfly, for example. And it's an egg, and then a caterpillar, and then a pupa, and then finally the fully grown adult, the thing that you think of as a butterfly. But they're really all the same creature, just different stages that have different appearances. And so that's what's going on also when you look at stars in the sky. You might be able to see stars that are at different stages in their lifetime but they're not really fundamentally different types of stars. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about that a little more and show you some examples. Um, and we keep talking about life and death of a star. So we have another poll question for you now. So get ready. How long do stars live? We've given you three options, about as long as a human, millions to billions of years, or do they live forever? So put in your best guess, give us your ideas. I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. We know that some of you are watching uh, your screen with other people, so you feel free to discuss and come to a consensus when you vote. And do not worry if you're not sure yet. Our goal today is to be able to try to give you a clearer picture of some of these questions, but we're, we're curious what you think. Okay, let's see. All right, most of you all got it. Millions to billions of years. Um, and so, and actually somebody did, at least one person said, mm, maybe it's just about as long as a human. That would be amazing if that were true, because then 
one single astronomer or maybe a couple of generations of astronomers could actually study the life of a star from beginning to end. But we can't do that because stars, depending on their mass, really high mass stars go for just millions of years, live fast, die young. And then the lower mass stars like our sun go for billions of years. So we can't actually watch a star be born, go through its whole life and then end its life. Instead, we have to look at different stages, stars that are in different stages of their lifetime and make inferences. So let me give you another analogy. Imagine that you uh, are an alien coming to Earth and you've only got one day on Earth and you're gonna try to understand um, these different observations you make. Uh, you, see, you see human babies in the nursery. You see uh, children playing on a playground. You see adults walking around and you know, doing their work. Maybe you see elderly adults uh, enjoying their lives, or maybe you even see a human being buried. Um, and you might be able to make some inferences from those observations that those aren't in fact different, fundamentally different types of humans. It's all, it's all humans just in different stages of their lives and they look different. You know, we look different when we're babies and when we're really old. Um, and so we can also make inferences about the lives of stars by observing them in different stages of their lifetimes. I really like that analogy because, you know, like it or not, all we get when we look at these things is a snapshot. And some astronomers do try to track these things over years, but, um, you know, single years on the scale of a star's lifetime uh, often doesn't give us a big look at all of those different stages. Um, so I think we have an image for you that we can share uh, to help illustrate a little bit more about this cycle. So here we are. Um, and I know there's a lot of pieces to this, so we're actually going to leave this one up for a little while um, and kind of talk through it with you um, so that we can describe what's happening, because uh, I know there might be some new vocabulary and um, uh, some interesting stuff uh, on this. So where, where do you think we should start on our, our chart of star lifetimes, Amy? Maybe on the left side, y'all see how there's sort of like a, like a big circle on the left side, and at the top it says sun-like star. So here's the deal. The fate and lifetime of a star depends on its mass, how much stuff it has. So first we're going to consider stars that are like our sun. Um, and you can see the cycle that a star like our sun goes through. And um, you'll notice that, that all stars, whether it's a sun-like star or on the right side, a massive star, starts out as a, a protostar from a, a cloud of gas and dust known as a star-forming nebula. And when that protostar compresses under the force of gravity, its core becomes hot enough, then the star will begin nuclear fusion. So we, we talked about that uh, a little bit on Tuesday. Uh, nuclear fusion is fusing hydrogen into heavier elements in its core. That's what's going on. And then if it's a sun-like star, it actually remains stable um, for billions of years, fusing hydrogen in its core. And then, um, and that's by the way, is where our sun is right now, stable. And then after several billion years, it uses up its hydrogen uh, in the core and turns into a red giant now mostly fusing helium. Um, and then it uh, starts losing its outer atmosphere. It's like a giant weight loss diet. And uh, something called, uh, it becomes something called a planetary nebula, which is a little bit of a mis misleading term, doesn't have anything to do with planets. Um, and uh, at, at this point, elements that have been created in the star's life cycle, uh, cycle back into the interstellar medium that provides material to make new stars. And then what's left over is a, uh, the, the leftover part of the core of the star cools down and becomes something called a white dwarf. Um, and then eventually that white dwarf cools off so much it no longer glows and becomes just the dark cold remains of the star. Okay, Nick, do you want me to keep going? Uh, we can- Yeah, I, I love your description. Part. And I will just say um, a lot of these arrows um, kind of depend on a lot of factors that are happening around these stars and inside of these stars. So it's possible that when you have a planetary nebula, that there, that there is a white dwarf inside of it, but that it can still uh, become a star forming region, um, the other material outside of it. So it, it can kind of be both sometimes, um, but um, I think this chart does a good, good job of kind of describing those pieces. But yeah, Amy, I'd love for you to talk about maybe the, the right hand side as well. Okay, so mass is everything in terms of what happens to you as a star. So now we're talking about massive stars. We're talking like, you know, eight times or more the mass of the sun. So this is not going to be what happens to our sun. 
Um, but if it's a massive star, it remains stable for only millions of years rather than billions of years. So it's fusing hydrogen in its core. And then after several million years, the star uses up its hydrogen and turns into a red supergiant, it continues to fuse atoms in its core into heavier and heavier elements until the core starts filling up with iron. And that's the end of the line for fusion. Um, the core then collapses under its own weight, can no longer be held up by heat generated by fusion. And then there's explosive shock wave and uh, energy that's generated from, from the core collapse. It starts moving outward, heats the surrounding layers of the stars, and then boom, there's a supernova explosion, uh, which Nick demonstrated for you on Tuesday using just a tennis ball and ping pong ball. Um, and this blast, the supernova blasts most of the star just plow, out into outer space. And um, the heavy elements that cr get created in the star and during the supernova explosion um, can get recycled back into the interstellar medium that provides materials to make new stars and planets. Um, so some of the elements in your own body were created in stars and by supernova explosion, which is pretty mind blowing. It definitely and is. This is, you know, probably my favorite fact about space. I, that's, that's a bold claim uh, because I have lots of fun facts about space, but the idea that no matter what type of star you are in, in, in one way or another, it's likely that, what you're made of ends up forming one of these star forming nebula that that makes new stars it's like everything out in space is recycled um over a really long period of time um so i think that's kind of beautiful you know and as we look to find some examples in our real sky hopefully we'll give you some ideas of how how you can see this you know with a telescope um as well because there are really a, a number of good examples of each of these uh phases that, that we can see from here on earth and then so after this uh, supernova explosion, what's left uh, in this case of a massive star doesn't become a white dwarf. It's either something called a neutron star or a black hole. And we talked more about black holes in a previous session earlier, earlier in June. Um, and that if you're wondering, well, wait, what determines whether it becomes a black hole or not? It depends on how much mass is in the core. Um, and, and if it's more than eh, three times the mass of the sun, it can become a black hole. It just collapses under its own weight, essentially. Okay, and then um, Nick, unless you want to say anything else about the diagram, I, I think we want to show everyone examples of uh, many of these different stages that you can see in the sky. Yeah, let's switch it over. Um, I, I will just say I love this diagram. I think it's one of the, one of the best I've seen at, at showing this process. Um, but if you have questions about anything, I know that there's, again, probably a lot of new vocabulary and things like that. Just put them in the Q&A down there and we'll try to um, clear anything up. But I think... Um, for something that's so big and takes so much time, that was a really, really good look at it. But yeah, let's look at our sky. I'm gonna switch us over. Okay, um, while, you're, while you're switching us over, I'll just mention for those that wanted to try to find that diagram, um, if you do an internet search for night sky network and lives of stars, you'll probably be able to get to it pretty quickly. Okay, sorry to interrupt you, Nick. No, no, it's fine, um, th that's good. Um, so that folks can maybe find it on their own, but we, we have switched over, so now your view might be a little bit different. Uh, you should be seeing a daytime sky. And if you've joined us before, this might look familiar, but if you happen to be with us for the first time, this is what the Stellarium program looks like. It's kind of like a flat screen planetarium. Um, and it gives us a look at what's up above us um, in, you can manipulate it, you can change it at the same time. So just for reference right now, we're facing towards the south. West is gonna be over here on the right-hand side of the screen. And east, you can't really see it, but it's hiding right over here, um, the letter E at least. So um, that, that'll be good to kind of keep track of what direction we're facing as we move forward. And I did say that it's a daytime sky. Uh, it's the, the sky from, from right now-ish. Um, and uh, what we can do is move us towards the nighttime. Now we do have one example uh, of something on that chart that's in the sky right now, and that's our sun, our kind of average but special star. <laughs> Yeah, so, you, you can see a star in the daytime. Yeah, so there's there's one example for you. And don't worry, you know, one of our most common questions is, is the sun going to blow up? Um, is the sun going to become a black hole? And I'll go ahead and head that off right now and say, you know, based on what we know about what type of star it is, it has a lot of life left. So, um, you know, we have another four, four and a half billion years before our sun even really changes a lot. So uh, we live in a good time, I guess. But let's make it dark. What do you think, Amy? But yeah, let's go see some other stars and check out stars in different stages. So for your reference, I'm moving time forward. Um, you might notice our clock down here speeding up. It is on a 24 hour clock or military time. Um, so, you know, we just passed 
what looks like 15 o'clock. That's 3 p.m. Now we're at 4 p.m. So uh, maybe you can kind of keep track there. But we know we're just past our summer solstice, which means we have a really long day here in the Northern Hemisphere. And something um, interesting um, rose in the sky in the daytime, the moon. Hmm. So you might might try to look for that, see if you can spot it in the daytime. So I'm going to take us right here to about 11 p.m. I know that is very likely past bedtime for some of us. Um, but that is, that's the danger with the summer sky is your sunset time is so late that you don't get that really good darkness until it's kind of past bedtime sometimes. But, um, you know, for those of you that uh, happen to have that early bedtime, you'll be able to do a lot more stargazing in the early evening hours in the winter. Uh, summer is just kind of tough for that. And so we have some things to show you. Normally when we show you things in the sky, when we give you a sky, sky tour, we often go from west to east across the sky um, and then go forward through the night from there. We're gonna jump around a little bit because we wanna go instead in the order of the stages in the life of the star. And we've picked out a few examples to represent um, different stages. So um, first of all, I think we'll look for a star forming region and for that, we're going to need to look near uh, the constellation of Sagittarius, which is supposed to be an archer, uh, a centaur, so half man, half horse, who's an archer. I don't know about you, Nick. I don't see any centaurs or <laughs> anybody wielding a bow and arrow in the sky there, no matter yeah, how much. Yeah, that's a tough think. sell, but um, maybe we can at least find the right direction uh, to look for and this. I I do see something else though. I see a teapot. I see Sagittarius the teapot, which Nick, you're doing a nice job of outlining right there. Yeah, so maybe you can follow my cursor and see Candle. what we mean by teapot. Lid. It, it has a little spout right here that looks like a triangle, has a lid, another little triangle, little curved handle and a base. And we know it's a teapot and we know that the tea is ready because you can see the steam. <gasps> and that of course is the Milky Way. Yeah. <laughs> So let's outline uh, this constellation uh, that's uh, the star name there. Uh, but if we kind of connect the dots, you see that the teapot shape is there. There are other parts that might, might help our imagination with this archer, um, but maybe, you know, we can even get a picture of Sagittarius here and that can help illuminate it for us a little bit. Yeah, he looks like he's aiming at Scorpius. We'll get to that constellation next. And um, we wanna show you something that's near um, Sagittarius called the Eagle Nebula, also known as M16, Messier Object 16. And so you notice what I just did. I, I brought up a search window to type this in because as much as I love, you know, looking around the sky to find these things, you can't see many of them with the naked eye. So that means you need something like a telescope, or in this case, I need my search function to figure out where it is in the sky. So this is the area where this Eagle Nebula is. Let's zoom in. And take a look. So if you had a high powered telescope, maybe you could get a view like this. Um, and as Amy mentioned, this is one of those regions uh, where stars are forming. Um, so. And Nick, if, I think you have a much more dramatic image that may look familiar. Right. So there's a, there's a really familiar pattern right here in the middle and you can kind of see its structure here, but I'm actually going to switch us back over um, to our slideshow and show you this picture. You might have seen it before. Um, these are known as the pillars of creation, um, but it's kind of a more specific deep part of that uh, Eagle Nebula. So these big plumes of gas, these are bright stars you can see in the foreground or background, by the way, um, but these big plumes of gas are places where new stars are being formed. So this is where, um, in one way or another, those stellar explosions or uh, planetary nebulae have spread out and uh, this is what that material looks like to us. Of course, this is a image that's taken by the the Hubble Space Telescope, I believe, and it um, you know has lots of layers and lots of filters and things like that. But this is like the shape of these regions up there in space. Yeah. So don't expect to see this through your telescope at home. <laughs> won't be won't be quite this dramatic. Yeah, unfortunately. So we have a star forming region. Let's um kind of move. Chronologically here, we'll go back to our Stellarium sky. Sorry, it takes me a second to zoom out there. Um, we're back to Stellarium. Let's zoom away from the Eagle Nebula. 
And here we are. Let's maybe find another example. You said that we were going to look at Scorpius, the scorpion. Yeah. So why don't we teach people how to find that if you're not already familiar. If you are familiar, you probably already picked out the shape of the scorpion. It's to the right of Sagittarius, and it has a bright star marked with a bigger dot called Antares. That's the heart of the scorpion. And then it's kind of tail and ends with a two-star stinger there. And uh, maybe with some imagination, you can see a scorpion, or if you prefer, maybe you see a fish hook or something else. It's up to you, whatever you want to imagine. And uh, in the boundaries of the constellation Scorpius is an object called M7, our Ptolemy's cluster, and it's an open star cluster. It looks like Nick's going to search for it right now. Yeah, that is, you know, one of the beautiful things about Stellarium is if you aren't sure where something is, or, you know, you just want to be a little more specific, you can just search for it. So I'll use that. Uh, today. Let's zoom in. Okay, so this is an open star cluster. These are stars formed out of the same cloud of dust and gas. They're still gravitationally bound there. I always think of um, open star clusters as stars that are like a pack of young teenagers still moving together in a pack, <laughs> um, moving in the same direction in the galaxy. But we have a, we have a prettier image, I think. We sure do. And uh... That's a little more detail for you there. So those bright bluish stars are, are some of those young stars. Um, we have a rule of thumb for talking about star color and age. And now there are definitely exceptions to the rule sometimes. But in general, um, I like to say that, that um, stars can be blue and new or red and dead. And uh, again, there are some exceptions to this, but these bright blue stars are, are releasing tons and tons of energy. They're, they're in the beginning stages of their life. And as Amy said, live fast, die young. You know, they, they burn up their energy really fast and, and don't live for quite as long as some, some other types of stars. But um, some of the other examples of red giants, and red supergiants, they're nearing the ends of their lifetime. So um, in just a moment, we're gonna show you a couple of those as well. And when we say young, we're talking about stars that are about 200. <laughs> in this case, many of these stars are only 200 million years old. <laughs> right, so yes, young and old on the scale of human life, not really applicable here. That's right. a really good point. Generally, okay. the, the cluster was born 200 million years ago, <laughs> what I should okay. have said. Um, all right, so Back we're, we're going to move to middle-aged, I think. Yeah, let's do it. Um, lots of examples, but we'll just focus on a couple because they're part of a prominent star pattern um, called the Summer Triangle. So if y'all want to look around right now, you can probably figure out how many stars make up the Summer Triangle three. And you can probably find a lot of triangles in the sky, but we're going to form a triangle out of that star Vega. You might see it labeled on your screen. And then there's two other bright stars nearby. So Vega is part of Lyra the Lyre, Altair is a part of Aquila the Eagle. And then there's another star that is, uh, I would not characterize as middle-aged. So let's focus on uh, Vega and Altair. Um, Nick, is it possible to highlight Altair again since the label didn't come up for it? Yeah. There we go. Okay. So um, these are stars in midlife. And uh, if you went to one of our earlier sessions, I told a story, you'll see that they kind of are, are on either side of the Milky Way. There's a famous um, story told throughout Asia, but there's a, a Chinese version of it I really like where Vega and Altair are seen as um, a couple, a romantic couple who have been separated by a silver river of the Milky Way. And, uh, and I guess they're a middle-aged couple because these are, these are stars in midlife. And then, um, and then there's really no point in zooming in on them in case you're wondering why we're not, because stars are not very exciting. <laughs> Generally, individual stars through a telescope, they just look like brighter pinpoints of light. <laughs> um, and then we can show you a couple of elderly stars. Um, so, the sun eventually will become a red giant. We can show you an example of a red giant, which is Arcturus. And there it is. And it does look noticeably red reddish in the sky. It's a very bright star. Um, if, you, if you haven't spotted it yet, um, go out on the next clear night after sunset and it'll, it'll grab your attention. Arcturus and Vega in particular will really grab your attention because they're very bright. Arcturus will be the one that looks more orangish or reddish. Um, so eventually the sun will become a red giant like that. Um, the sun is not massive enough to become in its elderly age a red super giant. So we've already showed you an example of that. Yeah, Antares. Uh-oh, you didn't want me to click on it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Sometimes Stellarium just picks other things 
It's probably a satellite in that direction or something. Ah. There's Antares. Okay, and then um, let's talk about the future of our sun. So billions of years from now, like five billion or more years from now, um, the sun will reach the end of its life and it'll become a planetary nebula. It'll puff off those outer layers in a giant weight loss diet. And we've got an example of that for you, of the future of our sun, M57, or the Ring Nebula. And it's in Lyra the Liar, near Vega. And um, there's a Stellarium's representation of it. And so remember that a star like the sun um, becomes a planetary nebula, and then what's left is a white dwarf. And you can actually see the white dwarf in this image. Yeah, so this is the better picture of the Ring Nebula. Um, and I, I think this one is beautiful, both because of the kind of color composite of all these gases, uh, but also because, as Amy mentioned, this is the eventual fate of our star. Um, so where we are in space, billions of years from now, an outside observer could see something like this. And just to lower your expectations, should you ever see this, if you have a telescope at home, definitely try to find the Ring Nebula. We often look for it um, at sky watching sessions. It's not going to look like this. It's not going to be this dramatic. It'll look, um, I think it looks like a smoke ring, like a gray smoke ring or a gray Cheerio. So you, you won't see this color in this detail when you, when you look through a, you know, a regular <laughs> amateur telescope, but it's, it's a really striking sight. It's, I don't know, Nick, I think it's one of my favorite things to look at. It's oh, absolutely. I always uh, have to uh, rely on our astronomers from the Chapel Hill Astronomy Club and Raleigh Astronomy Club, our, our partners in sky watching, because they're so much better than me at finding the Ring Nebula. I always have to ask for their help. Uh, but it is beautiful once you get to look at it through a good telescope, that's for sure. And okay, then, one more example, right, Amy? Yeah, um, let's do um, the death of a massive star. Um, now, we can't show you a supernova happening right now. There's no supernova happening right now. But had you been around 8,000 years ago, <laughs> and, you know, so long ago before the first pyramids in Egypt, if you looked at the sky in the direction of Cygnus the Swan, um, you would have seen um, a star so bright um, that it would have looked brighter than Venus because it, would, it had gone supernova. What we see now, 8,000 years later, is the remnant, the supernova remnant. And you can, it's huge, by the way. It doesn't even fit into the single eyepiece of a telescope. If you want to see the whole thing, you have to actually move the telescope around. And um, this is a really good image. We have an even more uh, dramatic image of what's called the, the Western Veil. Yeah, so we're going to be kind of zooming in on this part up here. You see this bright star labeled 52 Cygnus. Uh, keep an eye on that because I'm going to share um, even more detailed image ah. of the veil nebula, the Western veil nebula. And also known as the witch's broom, this part of it. And it's, so, still, it's still expanding. It, it went is. supernova 8,000 years ago and the filaments have been tracked as moving by the Hubble Space Telescope by taking comparing images taken uh, 18 years apart. And, and uh, as Amy mentioned, um, this, what you're seeing here is still moving and uh, um, you see some of the differences in um, types of gas and things like that as, as it moves. Um, so, uh, you know, if we track this 100 years from now, I bet the shape of this nebula is going to look a little bit different to us. Okay. okay. Well, hopefully that gave you all a pretty good snapshot of some examples in our summer sky. We got really lucky that we had so many good examples right here in our summer evening sky. Um, but I know y'all have lots of questions. So if that's okay with you, Amy, I know we have one more question for them. One yes. more poll question. And let's then we'll pop try to take up, some questions. Yeah, let's pop up the question of them. And while, while they're thinking about it, we'll, we, you and I can look at the questions that have been posed. Okay. Um, we had... I have a request for a person putting up the poll. There's a different question we were hoping to ask about the life stage that the sun is currently in. Yes, thank you. Okay, so y'all think about this, discuss with anybody who's near you. What life stage is the sun currently in? Is it still just a baby? Um, is it still just forming? Is it middle-aged? Is it elderly? Um, in, in this case of a sun-like star, that would mean red giant. Um, and then, or is it a planetary nebula or is it a white dwarf? And if y'all want to think about that, where is the sun? And then we're going to take a quick look at your questions. I think I see lots of good questions. I, I know. Probably only be able to get to a couple, but we'll give it a shot. 
Yeah, thank you all for for participating so much. This, you know, is our favorite part. We miss seeing you at Moorhead and Chapel Hill. We miss seeing you, you know, doing outreach programs at your school because questions from you are, are what makes us makes us do this work. So thanks again for putting them in. It looks like we got your responses. Yeah, some, some said still just a baby. Actually, the sun is about four and a half billion years old, so no longer a baby. It is, in fact, middle-aged like me, although I'm not four and a half billion years old. Middle-aged for humans, a little different than middle-aged for a sun-like star. Okay, and I'm looking at the questions, and now we're going to pop up one more poll question for you. If you don't mind answering this one real quick, how many people are watching this program on your screen? This helps us uh, keep data. Is it just you, or are there two people watching, three, four, five, or more? You can let us know. We'd appreciate it. Um, and I'll, I'll bring our faces back so you guys can see them here. Um, I, I saw a question from Evan, age 10, here um, that I think is really good, and it kind of relates to what we talked about on Tuesday and what we talked about today. The question is, when is the next star that will explode in a supernova? Um, and I love that question because um, there are lots of options. Uh, we don't know for sure which star in our galaxy or in the universe as a whole is going to go supernova next, but learning about which stars are ready, say which stars are some of those red giants or red supergiants, those are the candidates for going supernova. So we have an idea that there are certain types of stars that this could happen to. So one in particular that we mentioned on Tuesday that we didn't get to see today is in the constellation Orion. It's called Betelgeuse. Um, it's one of those stars that folks think could go supernova. So Evan, I'm sorry, I can't give you a really specific answer, uh, but it's happening all the time out there in space. We just have to hope to catch it when we're pointing our telescopes uh, uh, at these stars. And Nick, I know we're out of time. I want to answer one really um, quickly uh, about how often does a star die? And I want to um, turn this a little bit into a question of, um, I often get a question, I don't know if Nick, if you've gotten this one too, people see shooting stars, meteors, and they wonder if that's a star dying. Um, and that is not. Um, a, a shooting star is, is a misnomer. It's, it's a confusing, misleading term. It's uh, not actually a star, it's just little bits of cosmic dust, um, essentially burning up in our atmosphere, it creates a streak of light. Um, so your chances of seeing a star die when you look at the sky are not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, stars last for millions to billions of years, most of the stars that we see. Um, and also, by the way, it is possible that you're looking at a star that's no longer there because the star's light takes time to get to us, but most stars aren't that very far away, so you're seeing them only in the recent past, and it's very likely that a star you're seeing is still chugging along uh, just like it looks, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's a really great question. And, and um, I know there are so many more that we're not going to be able to get to because our time is all up. Um, but if you have uh, questions, we're going to keep looking at these and maybe, you know, talk about them a little bit next time. So you can join us then on Tuesday. Um, and if you have suggestions for content you'd like to see in these Morehead at Home sessions, uh, yeah, you know, please let us know um, whether it's, uh, you know, in the chat, in the Q&A, um, we, we're here for you. Uh, and as much as we like talking about this stuff, we want to make sure to show you stuff that you are, you're interested in. So with that, um, I don't know, Amy, uh, I would sit here and answer questions forever. Um, but I think it's time for us to wrap up. It is. I do see a comment came in. Somebody wanted black holes. We did do a session on black holes. You can find it on our playlist. And I think, Nick, you can probably explain more about that. Yeah, this is a good segue. So thanks, Callan. Um, all of these sessions that we do are recorded and they're posted on YouTube. So search for Moorhead Planetarium on YouTube uh, and you can navigate. It was like a week ago or, or two weeks ago that we did the black hole session. Uh, so you can maybe find that on there. But if you want to keep up with what Moorhead is doing in this time, please go to our website at www.moorheadplanetarium.org. Um, you can navigate to Moorhead at home from there and find all sorts of resources for activities to do, um, information about these sessions, um, our virtual playlists, things like that. You can follow us on social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Um, as Amy mentioned, YouTube is a really good place to revisit these lessons. And you can even watch a 360 Planetarium show for free. So um, even though we can't see you in person right now, um, we're excited to be able to share these resources and I hope you'll take advantage of them. But we'll be back with you on Tuesday. So we hope you have a great rest of your Thursday. See you next time. Bye.